Welcome, ladies and gents. Chris Andre here. Let's talk boxing. We're going to cover all of the fights that took place on the, is it the KO Chaos or the Chaos KO card? You know, the Anthony Joshua Frasso Gadu card. We'll cover all of the fights. We'll talk about the controversies, the technical elements. I will timestamp each of the fights. You can jump to whichever fight you're interested in if you don't want to hear about the entire card. We'll start off, though, with the main event. Anthony Joshua bludgeons Francis Ngannou inside two rounds in what was a devastatingly brutal performance from Anthony Joshua. No one has ever done that to Francis Ngannou in the UFC or in professional boxing against Tyson Fury. Every aspect we spoke about from a technical perspective in the preview played out. But I thought this was going to be a fight that would go long. I thought AJ would be a little bit tentative early on in the fight, not take too many risks. That wasn't the case, was it? Everything played out almost as though it was on fast forwards. You see, Francis Ngannou is always looking for that counter left hook. And as I explained, Anthony Joshua can sometimes overcommit with that right hand, especially when he's going to the body. And you saw that. He landed a couple of shots to the body in that first round and he was countered with a couple of left hooks from Francis Ngannou. He then got a bit more confident, Francis, and he got on the front foot and he let go of a right hand that landed on AJ. And you're thinking, he settled well here. But what became apparent is something else we mentioned. Francis Ngannou likes that down parry, just like Anthony Joshua does. But he does it far too much. On every single feint that Fury was throwing, he was biting on it. And when you're looking for that down parry consistently, what it does is it moves your shield out of place. And so that if you're able to trick someone as to when the shot's coming and you feint them and you use misdirection, he's going to go to block a shot that's not coming. It's like you're blocking a phantom punch. Then the real shot comes over the top. You will see that Francis Ngannou tries to parry a shot and he went down to the canvas in the first round. He comes out in the second round. And again, offensively speaking, and Ganu looked okay because again, he's looking for that trigger counter. We spoke about certain comparisons with Dillian White and I explained that White will catch and counter and will sometimes duck when he's doing it as well and then use that duck as a as a method of coiling to come back with a counter. He doesn't really do that, Francis Ngannou. He tends to want to use distance a little bit more and lean back and throw a, a counter shot, which is more dangerous. But he seems to have a better chin than Dillian White and he seems to trust it. But you're playing with fire when you're in there against a puncher like Anthony Joshua, who has the skill set of AJ. And we also spoke about AJ's ability to have really good distance control. Now, the distance control wasn't quite as good as I thought it would be from AJ, but there were moments when, again, Francis Ngannou was potentially overreaching. And we spoke in the preview that because Anthony Joshua is so good at taking that half step back and countering you or using a pull counter, if he's going to wait on Francis Ngannou to initiate the attacks, that's when Ngannou is particularly weak. And you saw on one of the two knockdowns, you see that Ngannou steps in with a jab, again from too far out, something we'd spoken about in the preview, and AJ's using that pull counter, right hand, and it was a devastating shot. All the technical elements we thought could play out did play out, but in a microcosm of what I expected the fight to be. It was almost like it was on fast forward and it happened in two rounds rather than over this course of 10 rounds. Superb display from Anthony Joshua and, you know, a whole bunch of other narratives are kicked off from that. We... Look, everybody knows on this channel, I've always said Anthony Joshua is an elite level heavyweight. Prior to the Alexander Usyk fight, the both fights, I was saying I believe that Anthony Joshua is elite. But I felt that Usyk was wrong for him and that his fans would feel that he genuinely won the fight. I actually thought Usyk might get robbed in the UK. And it was closer than it should have been on the judges' scorecards, right? But you could see he, he was quite dominant, Alexander Usyk. And in that final round, Anthony Joshua was really hanging on a little bit there. If there were another couple of rounds left to go, it, it really could have been a case of Usyk stoppage he looked dead on his feet AJ he practically collapsed in the corner and Usyk was sitting there doing Ukrainian folk dances at the end of the fight he had bundles more of energy well when the rematch came about and I felt that Usyk would definitely win the fight again you saw that whilst AJ had improved somewhat it was still an 8-4 9-3 type of fight I personally had both fights eight rounds to four to Alexander Usyk so he really did stamp his dominance against AJ that doesn't mean that AJ isn't an elite fighter he just happened to come across another guy who was very special the reason I'm bringing this up is because the commentary team and and the pundits sort of asked the question, does that really stamp AJ now as the best heavyweight in the world? Look, even if you think he's better than Tyson Fury, than Gilles Zhang, than Joseph Parker, than all the other top heavyweights in the world, there's one guy you can't have him ahead of, and that's Alexander Usyk. You just have to be fair with this. It's biased not to say that. He, he clearly stamped his authority over the course of two fights. And after the Robert Hellenius fight, before people were really sold on Anthony Joshua and they're talking about his mindset and him being weak, I put out a video to say, listen, in my opinion, I think he's back mentally. But even if you leave that aside, 
I actually think we're closer to the best version of AJ there's ever been. He just does need to get that confidence back in him. And you can see now what it is that I'm talking about when I've been saying that. The the marriage of the technical elements of his game, the wrinkles, the adjustments, combined with the confidence, really makes him look fantastic. Just because he's not quite Alexander Usyk, it doesn't really mean much. You know, Joe Frazier fell short over three fights against Muhammad Ali. He's still an all-time great fighter. George Foreman lost his only fight to Muhammad Ali. He's still a great fighter. Sonny Liston, the same. Just because you fall short against one specific guy, it doesn't mean you're not an all-time great yourself. Now, AJ, obviously, is in the midst of his career. I'm not sitting here telling you he's an all-time great, but he's got terrific CV. He's an Olympic gold medalist. He's a former unified heavyweight champion of the world, and he's looking brilliant again. You have to give him that. And, uh, you know, it's really exciting now, the heavyweight division, because if Tyson Fury is to overcome Alexander Usyk, that sets up a brilliant clash between Fury and AJ, a rivalry that will go down in the ages if he comes through that and them two fight each other. What I will say, though, is that this would have been a major blow to the confidence of Tyson Fury. I've been saying for a very long time, I don't think Tyson Fury is the fighter he used to be. I think there's been a major physical decline in Tyson Fury. And even now that he's lost weight and everyone's talking about him looking trim, his shoulders aren't what they were. He looks... I'm not going to use the word frail about a guy who's a heavyweight champion of the world, but he looks as though he's aged. He's been living a lifestyle and his body has been put through the mill, been abused with substances and alcohol and so on and so forth for so long. You can't keep doing that. You're going to have to pay the piper sooner or later. And when I look at Fury, the last time I thought he looked really good was against Dillian White, against Shizora, against Nganu. He just hasn't looked the same. And having seen Tyson Fury perform the way he did against Francis Ngannou. And then you see what AJ did to Ngannou. It just, it's night and day. It's huge. So from a confidence perspective, there's no doubt in my mind that Tyson Fury will be having certain demons now. There'll be certain voices in the back of his head saying, was this really just a stylistic issue? Because he did say after the fight, defiantly, styles make fights. AJ's made to measure for me. I'm going to beat Alexander Usyk. Then I'm going to go ahead and take out AJ. Battle of Britain and so on and so forth. He's talking. But does he believe what he's saying? Because when he puts his head on that pillow at night, I guarantee you in the back of his mind, he's going to be thinking, this guy just obliterated a man that I had a really tough fight with. Was I out of shape or did I actually train hard and my body just can't do what it used to do anymore? Because he didn't look the same as he usually does. And that, from a psychological perspective, is concerning for an athlete. Can I be the guy that I used to be? There are going to be doubts there for Tyson Fury. But when we're analysing and you're trying to predict fights of the future, you always have to have context at play. You have to apply nuance, right? And you have to consider certain things. Let's say the Nganu Fury fight never happened. And instead, Nganu crossed over to boxing and he fought a journeyman and he knocked him out. Then he fought Anthony Joshua and Joshua laid him out in two rounds. No one's going to be calling this a great performance. They'd just be saying, okay, it was an MMA fighter that came over and got bludgeoned, got obliterated by Anthony Joshua, right? So you also have to remember that sometimes somebody can be flattered by a performance. Perhaps Nganu was flattered in the way he looked against Tyson Fury and that his real level is not to be elite. Now, I certainly don't think Nganu's elite, but I also think tonight the outcome looked worse than what he actually is because AJ's got the type of skill set that can really expose the limitations of Nganu. Perhaps not everybody's going to be able to do that, but he does have that major problem with the way he defends using the backhand and the down parry uh, and stuff like that. He's going to have to develop his game if he wants to, to remain in boxing, as he said he wanted to after AJ post-fight was calling him an inspiration and saying he should stick into boxing. If he's going to do that, he has development to do. Let me know what you think, ladies and gents, uh, about this particular fight. Moving on from that, let's talk about a fight that caused more controversy. Gilet Zhang against Joseph Parker. Now, I did get a couple of funny comments because I was picking Gilet Zhang to win the fight either by stoppage in the first half of the fight and he dropped Parker on a couple of occasions or to win the fight on points. And I had one comment from Ray saying, yo, Chris, in your next video, please give me a shout out for my correct prediction and breakdown in the comments before the fight. You can refer to me as Mr. Ray, the boxing brain. <laughs> Thanks. Mr. Ray, the boxing brain, shout out to you. But my friend, I have to be honest with you. I disagree. I thought Gilet Zhang won the fight. And we'll get into that and we'll break it down. And obviously, I have no problems whenever anybody disagrees with me, right? So when there's comments like Ray's, obviously, it's all a bit of fun. Having said that, there were a couple of you that got quite insulting and got quite rude. So I'm going to lay down a challenge to you because I never have a problem with people disagreeing with me. But when you're rude, be man enough to stand on what it is that you're saying. I said to you, I want you to tell me the specific rounds you felt that Joseph Parker won. Because I believe that Gilet Zhang won that fight. Now, if you think that Joseph Parker won the fight, write down in the comment section down below what rounds you gave to Parker. That way, when I go and slow down the footage, like I've done in the past with 
Golovkin Canelo, the 12th round, that everybody that gave that second fight to Canelo scored the 12th round to Canelo. And I slowed that in that footage. It's still up on the YouTube. Go and watch me break down that round and then come back and tell me if Canelo actually won the 12th round. When I do that, I can hold you to your comment. And then after that, you can come back and apologize. Because I've got no problem with people disagreeing. But when you you disagree and you're rude, back up what it is that you're saying. And also, this applies to a couple of you who in the preview to the AJ and Ganu fight also accused me of being biased in a very rude way. One of you said that the reason I was saying what I was saying is because I'm mixed race and I was supporting Anthony Joshua over Francis and Gannon. First and foremost, I'm not mixed race. And secondly, it doesn't race does not affect how I predict a fight or who I'm going to root for. And secondly, other people were saying you're just biased for the British fighters. Now that you've seen Anthony Joshua dominate Francis and Gannon, like I said, I thought it would be a mismatch if he performs. I don't mind that you were trying to be insulting. Come back, leave a comment in the comment section and apologize for being rude, right? So moving on to that Parker Gillet Zhang fight, let's talk about what I think was going on here. The tempo was very, very low early on. What you saw is that Gillet Zhang came out and he did he realized that there was a discrepancy in the athletic abilities of the two fighters. Parker was faster. So if he comes out and he starts letting his hands go and he's falling short against the faster guy, he could be made to miss by an inch if he's leading off and get encountered with blister encounters and then he's not fast enough to get back at him. So what Zhile Zhang started to do is start to engage the lead hand of Joseph Parker and they were engaging lead hands with each other to stop either guy throwing the lead hand. Parker is crouched and he's staying a little bit back. So he's almost luring him in and saying, go on, I'm not going to take big risks. You take a risk and you come at me. So at this point in the first round, not much is happening. Zhile Zhang lands maybe a backhand or two to the body. I thought that he edged it on that, but it was a very close round. It could have been even. The second round I gave to Joseph Parker. Okay, he was a little bit more active. Again, not much is going on. After that, as the fight started to develop, you had the commentary team giving an awful lot of credit to Joseph Parker for work that was not landing. He was throwing faster shots because he's faster. So it looks eye-catching. But when you're throwing a punch and it's landing on the forearms or the gloves or it's grazing and it's not catching properly or it's hitting the back where the shoulder blade is, these are not scoring punches. Zhile Zhang, on the other hand, is landing sporadic short shots that are heavy. He's landing some heavy jabs in there too. So when you're looking at these, um, the, 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 the herky-jerky movement of Joseph Parker, and you're seeing that Zhang's just holding his position, and very slightly, he's taking that back foot and just bringing it constantly sideways, just behind the lead foot, constantly making these micro adjustments to maximize the distance so that he's not in a position where he can get lit up with fast combinations. You're hearing the commentary team saying, Zhang's not working. Neither is Joseph Parker. Neither one of them are throwing. But when Parker's letting go of his hands more than Zhang and they're being blocked or they're not landing flush, you're not scoring it to him just because he's moving. When you count volume, the volume still has to land, right? The way you score boxing is different criteria. Clean and effective punching is one of them. It has to be clean and effective. You have to be landing. The other one is effective aggression. There's no point in being aggressive if it's not effective. So when you're letting your hands go for it to be effective, you have to be landing. Now you could turn around and say, well, what about ring generalship? That has a small portion as well. And maybe Parker being more active gives him something of a ring general type of move. But that is such a, it's such a, an open-ended concept, the ring general. Who was the ring general? Was it Joseph Parker? who was crouching low and looking to throw sporadic shots, essentially fighting with a raiding style without the movement? Or was it Gile Zhang who was more efficient in his energy and waiting on Joseph Parker? You know, that's an open question. The fact of the matter is, when I show you this slowdown footage of the early middle rounds, you'll see that it was Zhang that was landing the clean punches. It was not Joseph Parker. Now, how did I actually score the fight? I thought that Gile Zhang won seven of the rounds. Some of them were very close. Seven, five with two knockdowns. I felt he won the fight. Here's the thing. A couple of you were saying to me, I thought that Joseph Parker won seven rounds to five. Base the kid had it seven, five to Parker. In other words, he had it 113, 113. Okay. I've got no problem with that. I'm not sitting here saying you have to agree with my scorecard. The fact of the matter is what that means is that there are a couple of rounds in there that I gave to Parker, to, to Zhang, that base gave to Parker. There were some slow rounds in there. That's not shocking to say. What is shocking to say, in my opinion, is Chris, you're talking absolute rubbish. Parker's cruising this fight. Zhang's not throwing anything. Don't make out like Joseph Parker was really, really active. The fact of the matter is, in my opinion, you saw that Gilles Zhang was landing clean shots. And when he was hurting him, by the way, when he was dropping him, there's a reason that the commentary team was saying, that looked innocuous. 
The reason it looked innocuous is because you're not realizing, you're not picking up how flush that shot's landing until you see the replay. I'm seeing those same type of shots landing prior to that. Just because he hasn't knocked him down, it doesn't make it less of a shot. Do you see what I'm saying? So for me, I thought that Zhele Zhang edged it. There's a rematch clause in there. I'm happy to see it. But again, the pattern of the fight was exactly as we expected in the preview. It was a very uh, inactive Joseph Parker early on, in some ways surviving. He had been dropped twice, not taking too many risks. Then Zhang falls off a cliff in terms of his, uh, his stamina in the latter half of the fight. I didn't have him winning any rounds from round eight onwards. I had a massive sweep to Joseph Parker. So you could see that he was going to fall off a cliff in terms of his stamina. But I also felt that Joseph Parker wouldn't really put it on him, right? We explained that in the preview and he didn't put it on him. To me, he was doing enough to steal the late rounds and hoping that he gets the fight on points. In my humble opinion, he was flattered. And the rematch is going to be very, very interesting. It'll be interesting to see if Gilles Zhang puts his foot on the gas early and goes for broke and says, listen, I'll either get stopped late or I'm going to knock him out. What I'm not going to do is try and do what I did and pace myself. It'll be interesting to see how that goes. Let me know. Let's talk about Israel Madrimov against Magomed Kurbanov. Madrimov got the stoppage inside five rounds. I expected him to look good in this fight. And uh, there were some really good moments in there. Madrimov, I thought, looked really good under the tutelage of Joel Diaz. He's, he's obviously continuing to improve as a fighter. A lot of people compare him to Gennady Golovkin. Maybe aesthetically they look a little bit alike. But in terms of the way they fight, completely different. I saw Kurbanov early on in the fight trying to conserve energy against that herky-jerky style. And he came in behind the shell and he's sort of remaining very, very almost just conserved and conservative with his approach, not wanting to exert unnecessary necessary energy and he was taking a look for the first couple of rounds he was a little bit too passive in the first round Madrimov landed a couple of right hands to steal the round in the second round a couple of left hooks were getting through from that crouched position and Kurbanov wasn't doing enough on the front foot to lure opportunities to counter he's looking for counters but constantly moving backwards and, and not being able to read when the shots were coming in order to counter so things were a little bit ominous for him at that point you then saw that Kurbanov started to stand a little bit too tall. You know, he's not sort of leaning behind the shoulder when he's trying to hide behind that shoulder. And against the guy who's crouching in front of you, he's going to be rising up with these shots that are very varied. It, he was just really struggling to avoid them. But after that, you started to see that Madrimov started to launch a right hook to the body. And you're thinking, okay, now he's starting to up the tempo a little bit. And when Madrimov had tried to adjust to that, the right hand came over the top. Also early on, Kurbanov was overloading with a right hand. And against the guy that moves and changes the level so well, you're going to be made to miss a lot. So what he started to do is shorten it up. So you're seeing some good adjustments here from Kurbanov. But he was up against a very skilled fighter. And he started to shoot shots into the solar plexus from that crouch position was Madrimov. And I put out a tweet to say, he's blatantly starting to invest in that shot because he's setting up the over the top right hand this was about three minutes before he landed a big over the top right hand and that led to the fight eventually being stopped it led to another flurry and he got him so you could see that Madrimov's thinking about setting traps now I've spotted it instantly so a guy who's high level and who's reading certain things and adjusting with you he might have spotted what Madrimov was trying to do there and been prepared for it and adjusted to it Kurbanov didn't he didn't see it coming he ended up getting caught and in the end, he was taken out, essentially. But Madrimov is showing some really good wrinkles to his game. We know he's naturally talented. He's continuing to develop. And he's going to be a real problem for a lot of the fighters moving forward at light middleweight. You know, it's a very interesting division. You've got Terence Crawford there. We don't know what's going on with him. There's rumors he's going up to fight Chris Eubank Jr. at middleweight. Winner of Thurman and Zeus. It's, it's a division that's got some exciting fights out there for Madrimov. And one that I'm certainly looking forward to seeing how it develops. Moving on to another fight that was controversial. Nick Ball fighting Ray Vargas. Early on, what you saw is that Vargas was on the back foot and he was happy to maintain range and you saw that ball was falling short and one of the reasons he was falling short is that he was loading up his weight onto that lead foot and launching in with the jab and what was happening is that Vargas was spotting this and every time that shift of weight went onto that front foot he'd take half a step back or literally just pivot out but because the launch is so linear once Nick Ball's in the air, he can't adjust. So as he's flying towards Vargas and he's too far out because his arms are too short, once Vargas pivots out, Nick Ball's moving in a straight direction. He can't adjust while he's in the air and come after you in a different way. In other words, he was punching from too far out. And because he was going after the head, he was falling short. Now, Vargas was targeting him from range very well, but also sporadically going to the body. The right hook to the body was landing consistently. And what Ball was doing at points is when the punches were coming from Vargas, he was trying to lean back. The problem with leaning back is that when you then want to go forward in order to attack, you're having to cover an extra amount of ground to get to the position you were in when he started the attack. He's then moving away after his own attack and he's so tall and rangy on you. Now you've got to make up the gap from where you leant back from and make up the gap that he's retreating to. It was far too much. What Nick Ball had to do early on is start to punch with Vargas, let go of his hands at the same time as Vargas. 
find a way to slip. And when you're slipping, you're essentially loading up at the same time as the slip. And that way, as he's coming close and you're moving in rather than out, after that, once you launch, you're close enough to start to land. Now, early in the fight, when he was forcing his way in, every time he would be getting quite close, trying to rough Vargas up, Vargas was very smart. He would throw himself to the floor. This is something that David Hay tried to do against Vladimir Klitschko. Every time they would come to the clinch, throw himself on the floor in the hope that the referee says, what are you doing? And it was working because the referee would be breaking them up instantly. He was not allowing Nick Ball to operate on the inside. But Nick Ball did look like he'd run out of ideas. And at that point, when he was not allowed to operate inside, he's launching in from range. I'm thinking this is going to be an easy night's work for Ray Vargas. But the pressure started to tell. And Vargas started to complain about everything that Nick Ball was doing, all the physical work on the inside. And at that point, you thought, okay, he's starting to not like the tempo here. And then came the first knockdown. Now, the first knockdown was controversial because he sort of spun Vargas around. And Vargas has spun. He has put both his feet on the floor, but he's perhaps a little bit off balance. His construct is affected. And then he's been hit and then he's gone down. Now, was he thrown and punched, in which case it shouldn't count? Or is it the equivalent of like a bump and punch where you've been put off balance and then hit, but ultimately, if you're not punched, you're not going down. If that's the case, then it does count as a knockdown. And I personally felt it was okay, contentious, but okay. Contentious as in controversial. People are going to speak about it. But I didn't think it was illegal. And based on the fact that he was consistently throwing himself on the floor, the referee might have thought, right, well, I can't tell whether you've allowed yourself to fall on the floor to cover the fact that you're getting hit here. How do you want me to know that? All I know is that you had both your feet on the floor at the moment you got hit, and then you went over. The second knockdown was a legitimate knockdown. And at that point, you started to see that Nick Ball at points was having a high guard, running in and coming really inside, forcing his way in, even being able to get close enough to land the jab consistently. And Vargas's exits had started to slow down. He wasn't firing the same sort of heavy leather and Ball's starting to really put it on him now. And at this point, you start to see him swarming Vargas and really start to beat him up. And so it was a fight of two halves, but I had Nick Ball winning the fight 114-113. There were three rounds in there that I thought were really close. The 6th, the ninth, and the 12th were really close. I gave the 12th to Ball and the 6th and the ninth to Vargas. In other words, for me to score it to Vargas, all the close rounds I have to give to Vargas. So it feels as though the wrong man got the job done or, you know, getting a draw. He got the result, right? He's the one that was happier at the end of the fight. But I can't quite call it a robbery because it really was a fight of two halves. And Nick Ball really didn't get going until the second half of the fight. And ultimately, it was the knockdowns, in my opinion, that turned it in his favor. But in addition to that, the ninth round, I actually gave to Vargas, which was close. It was the round after Nick Ball had dropped him. And that was a close round. And the thing is, what happened was it, it, there was that crisis, right? And he responded really well to it because he was ad, uh, active and he had good distance control. And what Nick Ball was trying to do, in my opinion, was try to pick the perfect shot. He'd allowed his tempo to drop a little bit too much. So early in the fight, you saw him rushing his work, launching in when he should have been smart about setting it up. Then when he got a little bit overexcited there, he wasn't able to operate consistently because he was almost looking for the perfect shot and being a little bit too careful about that entry point. And I think the reason that happened is because there were moments right after he'd hurt Vargas where he did try to go over the top and really put the, 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 the pressure on where he got clipped with a couple of solid shots. Now, obviously he's dropped Vargas. I'm not going to swing in his favor, but it might have just put a little doubt in his mind just to say, okay, be a little bit careful with the way you're entering here. Cause Vargas, even when he's been hurt, he's biting down on that gum shield. He's throwing heavy leather. He's still a bit of a threat. But Nick Ball, um, in my opinion, has to get a rematch here. Raymond Ford put out a tweet to say, I'm still willing to fight. Nick Ball. So he's going to have options either way here. He won the hearts and minds of the people, shall we say, even if he didn't get the result. Finally, let's end the video discussing Justice Huni against Kevin Lorena. Thumbs up if you stuck around with me till the end. This was a fight I was really looking forward to because uh, Justice Huni, highly rated prospect, a good mover. And then you've got Kevin Lorena, who, in my opinion, is a little tank. And I was saying, if he had stamina, he'd be a monster. The problem is that he just doesn't have the gas tank to be able to fire off sustained attacks. And when he fought Daniel Dubois and he dropped him on three occasions in the opening round, I remember a lot of people saying to me, you're disingenuous, Chris, in the way you're analyzing this, because it was so obvious that the fight was fixed. And I was explaining the fight wasn't fixed. The reason that Kevin Lorena couldn't put his foot on the gas and take Daniel Dubois out is because he does have these stamina issues. He is unable to sustain. And you saw that play out in this fight again. In the first couple of rounds, Lorena looked as sharp as ever. If they ever bring back a prize fighter format where it's three rounds and you put a bunch of heavyweights in there, add Kevin Lorena in a mix. He's really exciting and he's got a chance against anybody practically after three rounds. But what happened was, is that after he hurt Huni, you saw that he was unable to really jump on him and he started to slowly lose momentum and started to tire. And after those really promising couple of rounds, Friesen Boxing had tweeted me, shout out to him. And he was saying he'd put on quite a bit of money on Kevin Lorena. He was the underdog. And on paper, it looks great. And I understand what I was explaining that to me. He's had this really good burst 
but he's going to find it hard to sustain. I'll be surprised if he's able to, to actually win this fight. But freezing boxing very nearly got a win because in the final round, Lorena landed a massive left hand and he hurt him badly again. And it looked like he was there for the taking and there was time. And he just wasn't able to go for him in that same way and maintain that tempo. Th there were another couple of bursts, but he couldn't keep throwing until he finally just got him out of there. He couldn't do that. It just wasn't there for his gas tank. Um, and that's a problem that Kevin Lorena is going to have moving forward. The fight that I'd love to see Kevin Lorena in from a stylistic perspective is him against Murat Gassiev. They're both coming off of losses. You're talking about a lot of TNT in there, those fists, dynamite in both fists. They'll both be fighting potentially to salvage the opportunity to be involved in future big fights. It's the sort of trade fight that could be really explosive and one that I'd love to see. From Justice Hooney's perspective, he's still a developing prospect. There's talent there. He's a very good mover. And I like the fact that there were different wrinkles to his game. He altered his movement. He showed a nice step around on a couple of occasions. There was even a moment where he altered to actually fight like the bigger heavyweight rather than being on the back foot. He realized I'm the naturally bigger man here. Let me get up close. He was using his arm to pin and frame so that he showed different wrinkles. But for me, at times, the method in which he was moving wasn't always the most intelligent of approaches. You know, there was a moment, for instance, early in the fight where he was sort of employing this pendulum swing. He's jumping back and forth, back and forth. But he's not jumping to the edge of range and then threatening to come into the pocket and mixing up the distance in the way somebody like Dimitri Bivol can do or so on and so forth. What he was basically doing is just jumping in and out, uh, just jumping back and forth when he's out of range. Then he would hold his feet and wait for Kevin Lorena to come up to him without him necessarily doing much to dissuade that. He made an adjustment and he started to uh, throw a hook and then off of that hook, he'd turn and step around Lorena and that was a nice adjustment. So he's showing wrinkles. But it was almost as though he had to be punished first before he made that adjustment. And when he was doing those sort of jumping back and forth, it made me feel as though he was doing it because he was stiff and he was just doing it for the sake of it to get some life into his legs. I don't know. I think he's a very talented fighter, but the talk of him stepping up and fighting one of the, the top 10 guys, I think it's a little bit premature. I think they need to take a bit more time with Justice Hooney. Let me know what you think though, ladies and gents, about all of the topics that we've spoken about tonight. Thank you if you have stuck with me till the end of the video, or even if you just tuned in to hear my thoughts on a couple of the fights. Please don't forget to hit a stiff jab on the like button, a right cross on a subscribe button and an uppercut on the notifications button. Chat to you soon. Take care. God bless.